everybody, welcome back. Now it's time to solve some problems. And this time it's about the auto cycle. We just learned about how this is ideal for our spark ignition engines, and so let's actually solve a problem with it. Okay, so we have an ideal auto cycle and it has a compression ratio of eight. Okay, that sounds important. At the beginning of the compression process, air is at 95 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius. No, that's not chosen at random. That makes it a nice round number of 300 Kelvin, which is why they do that. And 780 kilojoules per kilogram of heat is transferred to air per kilogram, lowercase q. During the constant volume, okay, constant volume heat addition process. Take into account the variation of specific heats with temperature. Okay, variation of specific heats. And the gas constant of air is this value right here. Okay, so things I'm seeing right from the beginning of this problem is one that says variation of specific heats. That means tables. Whenever you see that word, just think tables. Variation, tables. It says constant specific heats. We can use our nice like CV delta T equation or CP delta T equation to get our values for internal energy and enthalpy. This one, we're gonna have to go to the tables. Okay. So we want to find we want to find the pressure and temperature at the end of the heat addition process. Okay, not too terribly bad. Let's walk through it. Now, what I always say to do for almost every single one of these cycles is to always, 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 oh, and also find that work done, is always draw the process. Okay? You have to draw the process. If you don't draw the process, you don't know what you're doing with it. Now, these processes, they don't have to be to scale. Like this one right here is nice and perfect because I'm taking it straight from the solutions manual. Yours don't have to be perfect. And as you note, there are no numbers here. Like I didn't put any numbers on this thing. This is not to scale. That is okay. It does not have to be to scale. But I do suggest that you make a little like flip book or something that has the different cycles in here. That way, when you're going through and you're doing the auto cycle or the diesel cycle or a heat pump cycle or an air standard cycle, you have what your shape should look like and you can use that to help yourself. Okay. Now, if we're looking at this right here, we have a constant volume heat addition process. That's right here. That's where Q is going in. That's important. We're going to need to know that. We're also going to have to figure out how much Q out is from four to one. So lots of little details to figure out and we can do this. So let's get right to it. So if we're going to do this, like I said, since it says variation specific heats, we're going to have to get the properties of air from appendix A17. Now I showed you in the last video where the appendices are. I also showed you how to interpolate, which we're not going to have to do for this first one. Um, but I'm not going to go ahead and pull the tables up now. So just know where they come from. And we'll talk about why you get the different values as we go. Okay, so 300 Kelvin, that is in your table, is a nice round number. You'll find the values there. And we get our internal energy as well as our relative volume. Relative volume one. Now, here's the thing. What might surprise you is you're looking at this like, wait a second, okay, why do we choose internal energy? Well, it's pretty simple because we're going to have a constant volume process right here from two to three and one to four. And since it's constant volume, enthalpy is not the thing we're looking for. We're looking at how internal energy changes. Okay. So the CC constant volume, and that's what you're caring about. Internal energy is your go-to. Okay. Now we have it at one. And then it says it has a compression ratio of eight. So that means that my volume one my volume two, well, I know what that is. Volume two over volume one is equal to a, oop, is equal to one eighth. There we go. There we go. Let's make sure I do my ratios right. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out my relative volume at state two is. Why relative volume? Because I'm going to use that to go back to my tables and find my internal energy at two. So I'm going to do that. I have a relative volume at one. I pulled that out from the table. I'm going to multiply that by my ratio here. As my little faux pas had earlier, it's 1 8th by V2 over V1 because it's getting smaller. And so I get a relative volume 2 of 77.65. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to use that? Well, when I went to appendix A17, I was able to use a temperature to get an internal energy, sorry, and a um, relative volume. And guess what? I can also use relative volume to get internal energy and temperature. I can do it in reverse if I want to. How? interpolation unless you're super super lucky and just as a note for the for this course at least 
If you were to go to that table and find like 77.7, don't interpolate, just take the value. It's close enough. What does close enough mean? If you find it within like 1%, you could probably just take the value. Okay. So we're gonna have to go back to appendix for the properties of air, and you're gonna to need to interpolate. Now, I'm pretty nice here because I'm gonna show you how to interpolate once again. I did it before, I'm going to do it again here. I'm not gonna do this every time, but I do wanna still give you more practice here. So I had a relative volume to 77.65. The best I could find was I found one value for relative volume of 75.5, another one is 78.61. There was no one for 77.65, which means I have to interpolate which tells me that my temperature is somewhere between 680 and 670 Kelvin, and my internal energy are between these two values as well. As a note, this guy seems eh, roughly halfway. I'm guessing, this is completely a guess, that my temperature is gonna be somewhere around 675. And my internal energy, 492, 492. Why am I guessing that? Because it's roughly halfway, since we do linear interpolation, it would be halfway between those two as well. But that's just a guess. We're gonna see now, okay? Now what I do is I write out my interpolation equation. I got my sandwich materials, now I gotta make the sandwich. So here it is. Just remember, since we're trying to calculate temperature at this particular moment, this is T low plus T high minus T low over, um, I'm going to call it V high, that's VR high, minus VR low, times VR minus VR low. Notice, T high is less than T low. <gasps> how is that the case? It's all based on how I make my sandwich. I took the lower value of the relative volume as my low one, and so I took whatever temperature that was, whatever internal energy that was. Those, these ones, you just connect it, okay? You're just choosing based on rows. So you have to be careful with that. If you're not careful, you're gonna get it wrong. As long as you're consistent though, it doesn't really matter if you choose one is high and one is low, it'll still work out fine either way. You can reverse all of these. I could have called all of these high and all of these low and it was still worked out just fine. Okay. So I got 673.1, ah, not quite halfway, but I wasn't within two Kelvin. I would've still gotten it right based on the homework assignments, at least for this step. That would've added up and probably gotten other things wrong. And I do the exact same thing for internal energy, 491.2, not bad, I said 492. So close, and that was just a complete eyeball. So practice that, you can do pretty well there. So we interpolated twice, we use these values. I now have my internal energy at two. Now, if you look at our, go back to our drawing right here, we had our auto cycle, something like this. So I found my internal energy at one, I found my internal energy at two, and we're gonna go all the way around and find our internal energy at the other two points as well. We're doing that so we can figure out about Q in as well as Q out. Though it gets a little bit easier for this next step. Okay. Now, we're gonna figure out what our pressure is. Why pressure? Because we're gonna to need to use that as we're continuing forward through our cycle and the auto cycle. Because it did ask for temperature and pressure here. And we've got our volume, we don't have our internal energy, sorry, and our temperature, we don't have pressure yet. How do we do it? Well, luckily for us, isotropic compression. Nice, right? Since isentropic, I can use my isentropic relations which tell me how pressure and everything else are connected. So, in this case right here, I have P2 is equal to P1 times my ratio of temperatures and my ratio of volumes, ratio of volumes. And when I do that, I get that the pressure is 1705 kilopascals after that isentropic compression. Okay. Now I have my pressure and my temperature, everything I need for here, and I can finally go through the heat addition process because it's asking me, what is the pressure and temperature at the end of the heat addition process? So now we're gonna add the heat to it. 
Now, one really nice thing here is that we know that my heat in is the difference in my internal energy from one point to the other. So this jump right here, if I was looking at an enthalpy diagram or inter internal energy diagram, would it be all because of my heat in? So my heat in is actually the difference between U3 and U2. But since I know U2, I know my internal energy at point two, which is right here, I can then find my internal energy where I want it. Which comes up to be 1271.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Well, I have an internal energy. I also have a table, table A17, that has values for pressure and temperature and everything else as a function of internal energy. I think I'm going to have to go there and probably interpolate yet again. And you do! I'm not showing the whole equation this time, but it's the same as last time. I'm able to, using my internal energy, um, take internal energy low and high, make a sandwich, and from that get my temperature and my relative volume, 3. I need that relative volume because it's going to help me as I go from point 0.3 to point 0.4 to figure out the properties of that last step. If you're given volume changes, use relative volume. If you're given pressure changes, use relative pressure. Just depends on what you have. Use what you got. Okay. So now we're going to figure out the pressure at the end of the heat addition process. I know what my temperature was. I got that through interpolation. And I'm going to have to use my isentropic relations or ideal gas relations, depending on which one I'm working with, um, to solve for this. And so I do. So I know P3 is going to be equal to T3 over T2 times P2. Wait a second, what happened to V2 and V3? Remember that this is a PV diagram and that we're currently in this constant volume process. That's going from 2 to 3. Because it's constant volume, V3 and V2 are the same. Therefore, they just cancel. Temperatures, not the same. Pressures, definitely not the same. And so we're able to use that to calculate what P3 is. Okay, so we can check off this first part. We have determined the pressure and temperature at the end of the heat addition process. So now we need to find the net work. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to figure out what U4 is because we need to know how much heat leaves the system at the end to get our net work. So now let's expand. So we have isotropic expansion. We already know what our relative volume was. And we also know that our relative volume at the end, right here, relative volume 4, is going to be connected based on how much it's expanding. So before we were getting smaller, so it was 1 8th. This time we're getting bigger. And you're like, wait a second, why V1? What's, where's that coming from? Well, V1 is equal to V4 because this right here is also constant volume. It's constant volume heat addition. It's constant volume heat rejection as well. And so I'm able to get my relative volume at the fourth point. When I do that, I interpolate again. Yes, this is one of those problems where if you're not good at interpolation, I would strongly suggest that you practice and see if you get the same values. If you get different values, well, maybe email me. I might have gotten it wrong myself. <laughs> I can't say I'm perfect. By the way, check it out and see. So with this, we get our final internal energy. We didn't actually need our temperature. I just kind of pulled it out because I'm doing it the entire time. And with our final internal energy, we can then determine what our heat out is because it's just a difference. So my heat out is simply my internal energy change from 0.4 to 0.1. If you're wondering where that is, drawn this diagram a billion times, that is going from here to here, 4 to 1. I have to get rid of energy to reduce, reduce my pressure back to my initial state. My volume's back there, my pressure and temperature were not. So I'm rejecting this, okay? This is being rejected. And then we can find out what our net work is, which is simply, what's the difference between the heat I put in and the heat I put out? That's how much work I'm doing overall which is 407.8 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, I know there's a lot here, but the biggest thing is you have to master interpolation, okay? Master interpolation, and you'll be able to do all these problems well. If you don't, you're really going to struggle. So please take the time to do that. Use this problem to check yourself. Well, thank you for listening. I'll see you all next time as we go through more cycles, so many cycles, but I promise things will calm down after a few chapters. Have a great day. 
bye-bye.